So last night, I stayed up till about 2 a.m. Because since Thursday, I've been wrestling with if this is the sermon God wants me to preach today. And there's another text in my mind that the Lord kept bringing up, and I thought maybe that's it. So I stayed up last night praying through it, working through a different text, not Relationships 101, just something different. And when I finished, I felt like it wasn't ready, and I was pretty at peace with that. I told some men in the church yesterday to be praying for me because I was wrestling with it, so they asked me today, how did it go, what are you preaching, which is always fun as a preacher on Sunday when you have to give an answer to that because Saturday was confusing. And I told them that I was preaching Ephesians 6 because the sermon's not ready, the one that God was putting in my heart. And then we're singing Heart of Worship, and all I heard was, you're ready. So we're not in Ephesians 6 today. I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, and many of you saw yesterday that it was Renee and I's sixth anniversary, which means, for those of you keeping score, Renee has tolerated me for six years. Not an easy task, but we always enjoy our anniversary dinners together, anniversary dates, and we play this little game every anniversary, and we go, what's been your highlight from the year? We both knew the answer was going to be Jonathan, so we decided to spice it up a little bit. And we said, what's been a highlight from every year we've been together? And so we started sharing all these highlights, and that date just really affirmed, reaffirmed to both of us that, man, I'm so glad to be married to Renee, and I really hope the Lord reaffirmed in her that she's glad to be married to me. Like, I, I hope she felt the same way, and I think she did. But I loved that day, and it just reminded me that I love her, she loves me, and I'm so happy to be with her for the last six years. I can't wait for the next 60 years. And as I was thinking through all that, I began to wonder, if Renee were to ask me, why do you love me, what answer would I give? Now, if your wife, your spouse, husband ask you, why do you love me, there are wrong answers to that question if you didn't know. The wrong answer would be by answering with anything that they've done for you, and that's why they love, you love them. For example, if Renee asked me, why do you love me? And I said, well, I love you because you're a good cook. Then what happens when she cooks a bad meal? If I say, I love you because you keep the house clean, what happens if it's not clean? I love you because you're nice to me. What happens the day she's not nice? See, if I answer with my love for you is tied to something you do, do, then there will be a day where she does not do that. So then, do I really love her? See, it's wrong for us to answer that we love somebody because of what they have done or can do for us. That's what you call a parasitic relationship. You call that parasitic because it's all about what they can do for you. And that's not a loving relationship. That's not a genuine relationship. And that kind of relationship will never flourish. See, the correct answer is not, I love you because of what you do for me. The answer is, I love you because of who you are. I love you for your character. I love you because this is who you are, and you are amazing and beautiful, and I love you. That's the right answer. And, of course, everybody in this room knows, of course, that's the correct answer. The wrong answer is because you do this for me. Yet I would argue that many of our relationships with the Lord are based upon, we love him because of what he's done. Or because of what he might do. We love him because of what his hand does. Rather than loving him because of his heart. How many of us would say we love God because of who he is. Not just because of what he's done. That we love him because of his character. His holiness. His love. His grace. And his mercy. Who God is. Rather than what God has done or he might do. See it's easy to say we love God and we're committed to him. As long as he's doing for us what we want him to do. As long as he's moving, as long as he's doing what we have been praying for, as long as he answers us and listens to us, as long as his presence and his power is felt in our lives, we can say we love him. But what happens when you don't feel the presence of God? What happens when God doesn't answer your prayer the way you wanted? What happens when God doesn't move in the way you asked for? If your relationship with him is just tied to him doing what you want, then you don't really love him, and you will not endure when he doesn't do what you ask. But we're not to love God because of what his hand can do. We're to love God because of his heart and who he is. 
See, we've made the point of salvation that you get to avoid hell for all eternity. Can we just be honest? That is a great benefit of salvation. But if that's the only reason that we wanted to be saved was just to get out of hell and then live however we want, then I would wager that's not genuine salvation. Because the point of salvation is not getting out of hell or even going to heaven. The point of salvation is we love Jesus. We want more Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. We want to do what Jesus calls us to do. Whatever Jesus calls us to do, we just want more of him. See, that's a faith that will endure. That's a faith that is genuine. A faith that's tied to just what God does is not a genuine faith. Because God is not always going to do what you think he can do. He'll do something better, but in our sin, we can't often see that. And you see, here's what we need to understand. Even when God doesn't move the way we want, God is always moving. God is always working. But this is why we need to look at Acts 19 this morning. Because we have said and we know there is exciting things happening here at this church. God is moving. We know this. There's joy here that is palpable. You can feel it. There's some excitement. That's all good. We're praying for God to move. I've heard members pray that God would cause us to burst at the seams and start talking about having to look for new land or going to two services. There's an excitement here, but we have to be careful. Because if we just want God's power and not God's presence, we'll miss it. If we just want God's hand without God's heart, then he'll move in spite of us, not in us and through us. Because God's going to move no matter what happens. The question is, do you want him to move in and through you or in spite of you? Because Acts 19 shows us the difference between God working in and through you versus working in spite of you. So I want us to look at verses 11 through 20 and see what what this passage teaches about God's power, and it first teaches us that God's power works miraculously. Look at verses 11 and 12. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands, so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. I mean, God is moving if it's just Paul's aprons or Paul's handkerchiefs or whatever it might be that's being brought to people and people are being healed, demons are being cast out. I mean, we would say that's an amazing move of God. We've got to be careful. Paul's not doing the work. See, we might think, well, Paul was doing great things, but notice how Luke records this. God was performing. God was doing this through and by Paul. Shows that God's the one who does the work, not the people. God will use us, and God will work through us, and God will work in us, but we can't force God to do anything. And when something happens, we can't take the credit for it. We give credit to the one who did the work. Here, Luke is reminding us, Paul was being used by God, but it wasn't Paul producing these miracles. It wasn't Paul who was healing the sick. It wasn't Paul who was causing all these miracles to happen. It was God through him. And I think it's safe for us to say that we want to be used like Paul was. It's not unfair for us to say that. We want to see God move in that way. And so we have to ask, why did God work in such a way through Paul? I mean, look at Paul's biography. He killed Christians. He persecuted Christians. He slaughtered Christians. And then God saved him by grace through faith on the road to Damascus. And then he was taught and he was trained for three years. And then he went out and became the apostle to the Gentiles, proclaiming Christ. God was moving through Paul. Why? I mean, look at his history. Look at his past. See, the reason why God moved through Paul was because Paul didn't pray simply for God's hand. Paul wanted God's heart. In Philippians chapter 3, he says, I count everything as dung just to know Christ. What was Paul's desire? It it wasn't to be used mightily by God. It was to know God. Paul's desire wasn't just for the power of God. It was for the presence of God. Paul desired to know the Lord, to sit with the Lord, to know Christ, and the surpassing worth of knowing him, the Jesus who had saved him from his sin when he killed Jesus' people, the Jesus who rose again to make him alive. Paul just wanted to know him. Paul didn't ask that God would just use him mightily. Paul didn't ask that God would just do an amazing work through him. Paul just said, I just want to know him. I just want more of him. And Paul's desire is the desire of all those who God has used throughout history. 
Look at all the revivals that's happened in the last 2,000 years. It didn't start with an initiative. It didn't start with a strategy. It didn't start with people who just said, God, do this. It started with people who on their hands and knees prayed and cried out to God and said, God, I want more of you. I want more of you in my life. I want more of you in this church. I want more of you in this community. I just want you. Those are the people that God uses. Those are the people that God works in and then through. Not the people who try to manipulate things and force God to do something. This last year, we saw a revival break out in Kentucky. Y'all remember the Asbury revival? Did Asbury cause that to happen? Who did? God. Why did it happen there? It was just a normal day. They did some worship. Someone preached. I even heard rumors of the sermon wasn't even that great. Which gave me some hope. But anyway... But what happened? Well, the service just didn't stop. People just wanted more. More of God. They were confessing sin. They were repenting of sin. They were worshiping. It wasn't a strategy. They didn't plan it. It happened because they sought the face of God. A few years ago, there was another revival that broke out in Hendersonville, Nashville area in Tennessee. Long Hollow Church. You've heard me talk about them before have some of my favorite people in the world at that church. But in six months, they saw 14 to 1,600 baptisms. Now, even if you're a mega church, that's an insane number. It didn't happen because Pastor Robbie was preaching an amazing sermon series and God just used him. It wasn't because they had this baptism initiative. It wasn't because, as some churches do, by the way, they opened up for spontaneous baptism and planted people in the audience to come forward and lead others to do the same. If you didn't know, that happens in some big churches. It was nothing they did. What happened? The staff in the church just wanted more of God. Something changed in that church's dynamic where they just sought the face of God and God brought the They wanted more of God, so God brought revival. Are you seeing a pattern here? Throughout all the revivals that happened in the 1700s, 1800s, Paul didn't care about numbers or statistics or filling parking lots or filling chairs. He cared about Jesus and making Jesus known and knowing him more. That's why God works through Paul. But there are people who will seek to manipulate this power, thinking that somehow they can control it. But you can't manipulate God's power. The seven sons of Sceva learned that the hard way. Let's look at verses 13 through 17. Now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul. But who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid, and the name of the Lord was held in high esteem. So Paul is being used by God. These miracles are happening. God's working through him. And seven sons of Sceva take note. They're traveling exorcists. Did you know that was a job in the first century? They would travel from place to place trying to cast out demons, which is a lot harder when you don't know Jesus and pronounce the name of Jesus. So they're traveling around trying to cast out demons, and they notice that when Paul does it, he uses his Jesus name. He uses the name of Jesus, and then the demons come out. Okay, that's the key. We're going to use the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, and then we're going to be famous. God's going to work so mightily through us. I mean, look at what they said. Technically, nothing they said was wrong. I command you, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, there is nothing wrong with any word said in that statement. There's nothing wrong about it, but it's fake and shallow. Because they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know his power personally. They just wanted to exploit it publicly. They just wanted God to move and give themselves credit. And I worry that there are many in our churches who have said the right words and who have never experienced God's power. Those who have said the right words, well, I walked the aisle. 
I said the prayer. I got baptized. I go to church every Sunday. I know the right Christian jargon. It's all well and good. But they don't know Jesus. We live in a culture today where it's really easy to fake being a Christian. Cultural Christianity is a plight on the church. Where we regulate our relationship with Jesus just to Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, and then we'll say the right things, we'll do the right jargon, and we'll be all well and good. But just because you say the right thing doesn't mean you have power. Just because you say the right words doesn't mean that you know the Lord. Because if you can even fool a demon in hell, how can you fool the Lord? They said the right words. I would argue if we go deeper on this, what they say here is actually pagan and wicked. You know why? Because they don't know Jesus, but they're in Ephesus. And in Ephesus, when someone uses the name of somebody, they're doing so to have control or dominion over them. Because if you remember, in Ephesus, magic and witchcraft were popular there. And magic and witchcraft back in Ephesus is not like magic and witchcraft we think of today. We'll get to that in a moment. But... They would use people's names, the names of spirits, the names of what we know to be demons, to control people. So what they're doing here is actually doing something very pagan, invoking the name of someone they don't know because they think that name has power to cast the demon out and to get fame. They knew the right words. They had the wrong motives. It was empty and it was powerless and a demon from hell could recognize it. I mean, could you imagine staring down a demonically possessed man and when you say, in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches, in the name of the Jesus that Larry preaches, in the name of the Jesus that Rio preaches, come out. And the demon just looks at you and says, Paul I know. Jesus I know. But who are you? Is there a worse statement to hear? I'd argue there's one. Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Lord, did we not perform all these miracles in your name? Depart from me. I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. If you can't fool a demon in hell with your faith, how are you going to fool Jesus? You can't. And cultural Christianity is a fake Christianity, and it will not endure on the last day. It will be exposed. How many of you are familiar with the show Pawn Stars? Anyone here show of hands? How many of you know that show? Okay, if you haven't watched it, it's an interesting show. It's a lot of history in it. It's pretty fun to watch. What people do is they bring in their items to this local pawn shop in Las Vegas, and they're either items of historical value or they're really expensive items. And what they do is someone brings in an item, they talk about the history of it or why it's so valuable, and then they barter about how much they're actually going to sell it for. Well, there's one episode where a man brings in what he believes to be an original Babe Ruth baseball card. And he brings it in and he shows it to Rick, who's a store owner, and says, this is an original Babe Ruth card and I want $65,000 for it. Now, if any of you have a legitimate original Babe Ruth baseball cards and you sell them, you have to give 20% to the church. That's just the rule. But anyway, this man talks about it. Rick looks at it. It looks real by all accounts, but he's not sure. He doesn't know. This is not his expertise, so he brings in an expert. The expert comes in, looks at the card, and says, well, at face value, it looks real, but let's look a little closer. And as this expert begins to inspect it, he looks at the man and says, this card is worth approximately zero dollars because it's fake. A lot of us might have a faith that looks good to everybody else. Seems like you know enough. Seems like you know the right jargon. You know the right wordage. You know Christianese. You're fluent in it. But if someone were to inspect a little deeper, would say, all your life would say is fake. Fake. And I don't want you to be fake today. It's possible to say, I've done all the right things. I've walked the aisle. I said the prayer. I got baptized. I go to church and yet not be born again. Because it's not about the words you say. It's not about the actions you take. 
God is not going to ask you on the last day, why should I let you into my heaven and accept the answer of because I did anything? There's one answer. And that answer is that Jesus saved me and the Spirit caused me to be born again. That's it. And there are people who claim to be Christians, who know the right words, who say the right phrases, who don't know Jesus. Who don't know the power of God in their lives. Who haven't been born again. They're functioning with this false confidence because of what they did. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you're not born again. And he is trying to call you and to say, come be real today. Let your life have power. Let it have meaning. Don't be fake. Be genuine. Because the kingdom of God does not accept fake Christians. It's those to whom Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. And if you're over here going, well, I mean, I've done good stuff. I mean, I'm wrestling with this, but you know, I've done good. Your best works are but filthy rags before your basis of your confidence and your salvation is on what you have done you're not going to have any confidence to stay there because it's not about what you have done it's about has Jesus saved you from your sin are you born again the seven sons of Sceva weren't born again and the demon knew it the demon knew their words had no power And even if you are a genuine believer, does hell have any reason to know your name? Christians weren't called to live safe lives out of the eyesight of hell and the demons and the devil. We're called to be on the front line. So I don't know about you. I want to be known in heaven by Jesus, but I want to be famous in hell. I want to be infamous in hell. I want the demons to shudder every time my feet hits the ground in the morning. I want all of hell to rejoice, like C.S. Lewis said, when the Lord calls me home because I'm finally out of the fight. I want hell to know who I am, not because I want to be great. I couldn't care less about preaching at a bigger church or going to preach at conferences. I just want hell to be afraid of me because Jesus is worth it to me. I want to know Jesus. I want to know him more. And I want hell to shudder every time a believer who loves Jesus hits the floor in the morning. I want the devil to be scared when we go to him in prayer. I want this church to be known in hell and afraid, or sorry, and the demons are afraid of this church. But it's not going to happen without believers who are willing to be famous in hell, who are willing to advance against the kingdom of darkness, who are willing to pray and to sacrifice everything for Jesus, who are willing to have a genuine faith that results not in any selfishness but in selflessness. We need to have a faith that causes hell to shudder because we just want more of Jesus. Because people who just want more of Jesus are a threat to the enemy. People who just want to use Jesus as a means to an end and people who just want to see the power of God without the presence of God, they're of no threat to hell. But people who want God, who want more of him, who are consumed by him, who just want Jesus and want to know the power of his resurrection, those are the people that hell knows and says, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, and I know who you are. Is that who you want to be? Because it's going to cost you. Spiritual warfare is not for the faint of heart. It's for those who just want more of Jesus. Because the demons of hell, they know who's a threat to them. Which is why when people say, well, the devil kept me in my chair this morning, or the devil made me do this, or oh, this is why I didn't do this. Sometimes I want to say, trust me, the devil didn't make you do it. He's not even concerned with you. So many of us are quick to blame the devil or the demons for stuff that goes wrong in our lives, but yet I would wager the demons probably don't know who you are. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I have Bible studies every day. I go to church every Sunday, and that's good. But are you praying for God and more of him and for him to move? Are you sharing your faith with the lost? Are you making disciples who make disciples? You say, what does that do with it? Somebody who is really enamored with Jesus doesn't just stop at Bible study. They actually do what it says to do. Are you famous in hell or are you unknown? And the better question is, does Jesus know who you are? Because he knows his own and he calls his own by name. And 
any who will repent of their sin and believe in the finished work of Jesus will be saved. And Jesus counts them among his flock. Does he know you? Because before you can expect God's power to work publicly in your midst, God's power always works personally first. Look at verses 18 and 19. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So what's going on here? Well, they've heard about what happened in Ephesus. The only reverse exorcism to ever take place in the Bible has happened. They didn't drive the demon out. The demon drove them out. And then God's power works in spite of them because at the end, the name of the Lord Jesus was held at high esteem. And so now this has happened. God's worked in spite of the fake people who try to use Jesus as a means to an end. And now the genuine believers are coming, confessing, disclosing, and repenting of sin just so they can follow Jesus. Now we read this, and oftentimes we get caught with the seven sons of Sceva portion. And we should. It's a warning to all those who want to use Jesus as a means to an end. But right here is the part that should humble every believer. Because what they're doing here is they're giving up not just fictional books with wands and staffs, I don't say this to be provocative, I'm not saying this to make you upset, but I am saying this. I think we do the Bible a disservice when we equate magic solely to Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis's books, or Harry Potter. Because I'm going to tell you, what you see in the Bible isn't what you see in those things. It is deeper, darker, and more demonic. And we need to understand what's happening here. They were burning books of magic. You know what magic is in the Bible? It is seeking to invoke the name of the spirits, we know to be demons, by the way, invoking the name of demons and spirits to have power, dominion over other people, to curse them and to harm them, and worse yet, to seek these demonic spirits and to raise the dead, to seek to know the spiritual realm without God. You want a modern-day equivalent? Not Harry Potter, it's a Ouija board. Think of that. That's what magic is. That's what witchcraft is. That's what's being condemned throughout the Bible, to seek to know the spiritual realm and to have spiritual power apart from God. It is dangerous, it is demonic, and it is destructive. And they're burning their books. You don't understand, these these weren't just hobbies for these people. It wasn't just a side job. It was a lifetime commitment of learning magic and learning how to do this. And they were throwing all these books away into the fire. They weren't selling them for profit. I mean, some of us sometimes are like Judas and go, well, why didn't you sell it so we could give it to the poor? They burned it. They didn't want ungodliness in their life, and they didn't want ungodliness in other people's life. You know when revival happens when God moves, when his people repent and confess sin. The first step to revival is repenting and confessing. And here they're repenting, they're confessing, but we need to understand just what they're sacrificing. You see, Luke, as a historian, gives us a monetary value of this sacrifice. He says it's about 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, 50,000 anything is a lot, unless you have 50,000 pennies, and that's just a little bit. But 50,000 pieces of silver, that's a lot of money. But how much really is that? Well, here's a comparison. In this day and age, it would be the equivalent of a middle-class worker working every single day with no days off for 137 years. So the salary. Not only that, it would be the equivalent of 100 small families receiving bread for 800 years. Are you starting to see how large that amount is? Three lifetimes worth of a salary. They weren't even batting an eye at it. They burned it. And they gave it up. Because Jesus was worth it to them. And God's power was personal to them. You see, for those of us whose God's power isn't personal, we don't know the Lord, you're not going to sacrifice for him. You'll be a Christian when it's convenient. You'll go to church on Sundays as long as your schedule allows. You'll do what you got to do. You know what? I might pray from time to time. I got five minutes on my way to work. I'll go ahead and pray. But when people know the power of Jesus in their lives, and I mean know it. I'm not talking know about it. I mean they know it. They've experienced it. They've encountered it. They'll sacrifice anything for the cause of Christ just to know him more and for other people to know him. 
Because that's what it's all about. You know why we exist as a church? You know whose church this is? It's not yours. It's Jesus's. It belongs to him. Our purpose, the reason why we're not in heaven right now with the Lord is because Jesus has been made known in our community and because we are to do anything to let Jesus be made known here. And people who encounter the power of Jesus will do anything to reach a lost man or woman. I was sharing this morning in Larry's Sunday school class, and I don't mean this to be derogatory or mean to anybody But when I preach about hell, or I talk about hell in a sermon, I'm guaranteed six to seven compliments every sermon. I just am. And I'll be honest, I love it. I'm a human. I like it. But I can't help but wonder, if we were really passionate about hell being preached and proclaimed, would we not live like hell is actually real? I mean, let's be honest. We live in an age today where hell is not talked about. So when you hear hell talked about from the pulpit, people like it. They're like, yes, preach the Bible. But is it leading you to do anything? Is the reality of hell leading you to do anything? Or is it just something you like to hear about on Sunday mornings from the pulpit? This past Wednesday night, I led prayer meeting, which, by the way, let me do a quick plug. Prayer meeting is becoming solely about prayer. And I'd invite you, if you want to grow in your prayer life, be here Wednesday night at 630. Okay, I would suggest it. I'm going to say this. If you're passionate about prayer and want to be a prayer warrior, come on 630 on Wednesday nights. But with that being said, now I've plugged it. Let's move forward. But prayer meeting Wednesday night, I, w- I was quoting a book from Leonard Ravenhill called Why Revival Tarries. And again, if you haven't read that book, you need to. I'm about to order a bunch of copies for us to have. It's the, it's the best gut punch you're ever going to feel. It's it's not nice, it's mean, it it hurts, but it's good. But in that book, he talks about prayer and the reality of hell. And he quoted uh, the founder of the Salvation Army as saying that if he could just hold men over hell for about 24 hours, that's all he would ever need to teach them about sharing the gospel. And while I was teaching on that, the Lord brought up a memory that I haven't thought about in 17 or 13 years. I haven't thought about it once. I, I'm pretty sure I haven't thought about it since it happened. See, I was at a nursing home, and I was preaching one of my first sermons. And I remember making this very, very poorly constructed theological statement. Like, the statement's not good, but it's the zeal behind it the Lord was reminding me of. I looked at these people, and with one of my mentors in the back, I said, nobody is going to go to hell if I have something to do with it. Now, again, I can't force anyone to receive Christ. God does the saving. But the zeal behind that was real. At 17, I didn't want anyone to go to hell. I just started pursuing Jesus faithfully. I started reading his word every day. I was preaching and teaching. Like I just wanted people not to go to hell. I wanted people to know Jesus because he's worth it. I wanted them to know his grace. And for some reason, I started wondering, why did that memory get brought up during prayer meeting? So I kind of kept it to myself and then... I talked to two brothers after prayer meeting. We met out there. Started off talking about our need to have a strategy and a training session for people to learn how to evangelize. And then one of the brothers, who will remain nameless, but he's called Joe Hillard, (laughs) who is a relatively newer believer, looked at the other brother who will remain nameless, Larry Hoagland, looked at his Bible and said, I don't know everything that's in that but I know the joy Jesus gave me, and that's enough to share it. And Joe, you have no idea how much that messed with me. I've experienced in my life the greatest conviction outside of my salvation Wednesday night. You can ask Renee, I had to call her and tell her that I have to drive around for a bit and talk to the Lord because I didn't know how to process it, because I really wanted to feel shame and guilt, because that would have given me some leeway to know it's not the Lord, but it was sorrow, remorse, and grief, which is from the Holy Spirit, which made it even harder. And I was driving her around, and I had to tell her it was a sin of omission, not commission, because I didn't tell her the first time, and she started wondering what had happened. And I drove around and just asked, Lord, where did the zeal go? Lord, where did the joy go? I've gone to seminary, I'm getting my doctorate, I've pastored churches, I've been a student pastor at churches, yet here's this brother, new believer in Christ, relatively, showing me up on evangelism. 
been so focused on trainings and so focused on just having the right words at the right time. And I started to wonder how many people have I talked to who either have been too busy or it's been inconvenient and I haven't shared the gospel with. How many of them are in hell now? Because they didn't hear. The gospel wasn't proclaimed to them. And then I felt in my soul, if hell is real, I need to act like it. And something Wednesday night shifted in me. I don't know what it was. I, dare I in a Baptist church say an anointing came upon me? And I can't stop thinking about every person I see and wondering, do they know Jesus? And sharing with them. You know what's not hard? You know what we learned from the Asbury Revival and the Long Hollow Revival? People want the presence of God. They want to experience it. But as believers, why are we not sharing it with them? They don't have to go to Kentucky when they live in Verdigris to experience God. You can bring it to them. You can bring Jesus to the people you know. But we're so focused on convenience and comfort and knowing enough. And we make all these excuses. Can I just tell you this? Any excuse you can make to not share your faith is an excuse from the pits of hell, never from the Spirit. Well, you're saying, well, pastor, that's hard for me. My gift's not evangelism. I've read the Great Commission a few times. There's no asterisk saying make disciples only if you have the gift of evangelism. All people. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 10, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Why? Because the laborers will make excuses not to go to the harvest. And people need Jesus. They need the Lord. And do we not realize that we don't have unlimited time to talk to them? We don't have all the time in the world. We're not guaranteed our next breath. And the minute you take your last breath, you'll never talk to a lost person ever again. And should the Lord tarry, what if they pass before you talk to them? Should the Lord return? Our time's up. You don't know when Jesus comes back, the invitation's over. He's not coming as a suffering servant the second time. He's coming as a conquering king to put to death all those who oppose his bride. The time we have is short. But we won't make the most of it if we have not experienced the power of God personally in our life. And you might be wondering, this is heavy. I don't know how to handle it. Well, the good news is, God's power is going to prevail no matter what. Look at that last verse. In this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. It worked in spite of the seven sons of Sceva. It worked in and through the believers who laid it all aside for Jesus. God's power is going to prevail. His word will not return void. But he's either going to do it in spite of you or in you and through you. And as we talk about, we talked about already, this is an exciting time in our church. But I would hate for us to have God work in spite of us and not in us and through us. So what's required for us to be used by God? You have to want the presence before you would expect the power. You have to want the heart of God before you seek the hand of God. And today the invitation is going to be very simple. I'm just going to ask the band to come up here. And they're going to play, and I just want to lead us in a time of response. So I want God to work in you and through you. I don't want him to work in spite of you. And the reality is he might be right now. He might be working in spite of you right now. He might be working in spite of you because you see all the good God is doing, but you know what? You don't want the church to get too big. You don't really want it to grow. Uh, we kind of like what we have. Can I make a statement as your pastor who loves you and you know I'm for you? If you claim to know Christ and you do not desire more people to come to know Christ, you do not know Christ. And I will not apologize for that. Those who know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the power that has worked personally and mightily in us and through us are those who want to see more people know and love him. So how is God's power working in your life right now? In and through? 
or in spite of. I don't want God to work in spite of you. I want hell to know who you are. I want hell to tremble when your feet hit the ground in the morning. I want hell to shake when we gather here on Sunday mornings. And I don't want to just be famous in hell. I want to be infamous in hell. But fake Christians will never be known in hell. Fake Christians aren't even known by Jesus. So today, if you're here and you would say, hey, I've, I've never really given my life to Jesus. I've walked the opposite of prayer, but I'm not born again. I'm fake. Good news is grace is sufficient to cover your sin. The blood of Jesus was shed for you, and all who come and repent and believe will be made new. You don't have to walk out of here fake today. You can walk out of here genuine and real. Would you come? If you're here and you are a believer, are you ready to advance against the darkness? Are you ready to be made known in hell? Are you ready to take the gospel to those who need it? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but, the, but we're to go in and plunder the strong man's house. We're to go in and plunder the kingdom of darkness because its king has been defeated. And guess what? The believer can go and we share the gospel and we call lost sinners to repent and we grow the kingdom of God because the kingdom of darkness has been beat already. And we're called to go. And we're called to do because Jesus is worth it. And revival does not start with us just asking for the hand of God to move, but because we want the heart of God. And it begins with us not desiring the power of God, but the presence of God. So what do you want today? Do you want God? Or just what he can do? This altar here is going to be open. and We should all either where we're at or at front, be bowing in prayer and saying, God, I just want you. We all need to repent of whatever it is. If there's any fakeness in our lives, it must be done away. If there's any disingenuousness in us, it needs to be done away with because the kingdom of God does not advance through fake believers. It advances in spite of them. How is God going to work through you today? In and through or in spite of? Because my prayer for you to hear Jesus I know Paul I recognize and I know you too so with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning how is God's power going to work through you and if it's in spite of come make it in and through today Lord we come to you and we ask you to move as only you can help us to not be fake but be real Help us to desire presence over power. And help us to desire power in, in our personal life before it's public. So God, help us all to come to you, to the altar, and just say, God, I want you, and Jesus, I want you. Let that be our heart cry today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand and come as the Lord leads? The of grace is Jesus Christ.